So, um, some taste and smell products, and I put some in there because not all of them work. You know, you see them at Davis Ace. You know, hey, this will chase your squirrels away. Just go sprinkle this around. Your problem is solved. No. They, that stuff wears out really quick. It may work for a couple of days, but it wears out really quick. Photo degrades and, um, you know, coyote urine is a popular product. They'll take coyote urine and, and bottle it and you spray that around. That can actually be, and, and again, I said what doesn't work here, but also may work. That can work, uh, but it's really powerfully smelling stuff. And so it repels everybody out of your backyard. And so, you, you know, you have to be kind of careful there. Um, uh, what's that? Almonds taste like Yeah, right, right. But the, uh, the predator, I, guess, I think I read somewhere, and I actually didn't follow up to see if there's any scientific research behind it, but um, that the proteins that carnivores produce, you know, when they eat meat, smells, is very evident to a lot of potential prey items. They can learn to avoid areas where they're urinating. So that's why, you know, the thought is you pour urine out there and they'll stay away. Um, but again, you know, it can wear out over time. You've got to reapply and stay on top of it. Um, some don't work. Uh, you know, there's some pheromone type uh, deterrents that you sprinkle out there. They, again, break down. They don't work very well. Um, predator decoys. So you see a lot of folks put, um, you know, plastic owls or, um, you know, little dummy uh, coyote decoys in the backyard. Those might work, again, for a day or two, but things, animals are pretty bright. They figure out pretty quick that, oh, this thing isn't a threat. It looks like a threat, but it's not a threat, and therefore I'm going to go eat underneath it and sit on top of it. Um, but I put this little asterisk here because predatory mimics do have some ability to, to work, and these are things that, um, and one product that actually is quite effective are these inflatable heads uh, with these giant eyes uh, that are re refractive, you know? So, you know, you know those things where you walk along and it kind of moves when you're looking at it? So that's the thing, it kind of spins in the air and wherever the bird is, these eyes are moving at it. And so that can actually work pretty well to protect, you know, the zone of, of where the animals can see it. Again, there can be habituation, they can get used to that but moving it around certainly helps. Put it in this corner of the yard, put it in that corner of the yard, put it in that corner of the yard. Nightly, weekly, whatever, just rotate it around and that can help. Um, a lot of people use those for cherry trees or other things where they don't want the birds coming in there. Is it gonna keep a raccoon out away at night? No, because you don't have that action. Um, the raccoon's gonna see this giant owl head looking at it and be like, eh, it's no big deal. They do, they have alarm calls and other things that they can, uh, they're pretty expensive and there's some question of how effective they are for the wildlife. Certainly distress calls can work on that same species. So if you had, for example, a, you know, a goal roost on, on, on your home or your business, you could go out there and play a, a feedback of a dying goal and that will keep those other goals from coming in there. Um, sometimes predatory recordings, so if there's like a, you know, a, a Cooper's Hawk recording can affect behavior of a predatory, or sorry, prey birds, so like dove, pigeons, these sorts of things. They can respond to that, but it kind of wears off. They get habituated to it, and once the threat isn't there, they hear the threat, but now it's not actually getting me, so then they become comfortable with it and they move closer and closer. So it's temporary, but the, like I was saying before, um, well, I didn't say it yet, but the last one here, using one method at a time is, it's not very effective. That doesn't work. You have to mix things up. So having that predatory call with a motion activated sprinkler, now you're talking, something's happening while I'm hearing this and I don't like it, so I'm gonna go somewhere else. Um, you know, deterrence, removing food, putting the motion activated sprinkler, uh, you know, mixing them up, moving them around you're gonna eventually convince those animals to change their behavior because they don't like being there. It's too unpredictable for them. So those were deterrents. Spent a little more time on that than I would have liked, but. Um, so hazing, and, and I kind of mentioned this before, what is it? Well, it's basically hazing is to, to do something to condition an animal to behave the way that you want it. And generally it is to scare that animal. Um, animals that become habituated 
to humans um, tend to uh, become more co comfortable and you get closer. But once you condition them that humans are scary and that they do weird things, then that distance gets further and further. So, um, you know, I have this picture up here because this is actually a legitimate hazing method. So these super soakers, um, you know, if there's a raccoon in my backyard and I don't want them there, I go and blast them with a hose or a super soaker. I'm sorry? Bob Bowen? No, it looks like him, though. How funny is that? I didn't realize that until you'd mentioned it. I should send it to him and say, is this you? No, I think I pulled that off of the Super Soaker website or something. So um, anyway, um, but this requires uh, you know, an amount of, of effort to make it functional. You have to do it on a consistent basis until you get that animal to a point. Much more effective for mammals, not so much for birds. Birds, you know, they can fly away from you. They're not as threatened. Turkeys, it could, that could work pretty well for, and it has. You can condition turkeys to distance, distance themselves. But it takes you being aggressive and, you know, essentially harassing these animals, which can be okay. And I brought two things. Um, here, which actually we use in uh, part of our coyote um, response hazing team. So we have noisemakers. Um, so, you know, we have these air horns, which work real well. You can buy them. I'm not going to beep it because it's really loud. And even this one is, you know, that's, you can imagine that one. And then if I did two, no, I won't do it. But, um, you're, you know, you're doubling up the, the, uh, the sound. This can work for birds. You've got turkeys roosting in your tree or starting to. And that's the important thing. If they start to show interest in that, you've got to jump on them. Can't wait till they're up there and go, oh, now I don't like it. It was cute before, and now it's a bummer. You've got to go, oh, no, I don't want cute. I'll go look at cute down at my neighbor's house. I don't want them in my tree. So that's when you engage them is when they're early on because they're less settled, less imprinted on it. Was that here? Yeah, in Davis, yeah, it was in the Enterprise. When was this? <laughs> I'm last to know. Okay. Uh, so that made me wonder, because we have a neighbor that runs out like a banshee every time the turkeys come by. Yeah. And he's got a pressure washer. Yeah. He sprays them. Uh, it's effective. I mean, it is. Those turkeys, they haven't been around since we did that. But I wasn't sure if that was harassing or if that was okay to do that. That is absolutely okay to do it. If you're a property owner, you have every right to do whatever you want. You can kill the animal if you want to. That's your right to protect your resources. What we try to say is, well, if you don't have to kill them, if you can condition them through hazing, that's the way to go. Um, unless it's an endangered or protected species, you got to be careful. Turkeys aren't. They're, they're, they receive some form of protection in the sense that they're a harvest species, but that's really it. I mean, you can shoot them legally in the right place with a license. In town, you can't, you know, because you can't discharge a firearm and the code. There's a whole other thing that I won't even get into there. Um, but that's interesting because it's the first I've heard of it, and I'm a little concerned that that might be precedent setting. I would rather see kids out there chasing these turkeys around um, because what that's doing is in, it's enforcing this fear factor in those turkeys, makes them uncomfortable to be in town, and then they'll eventually push out. And so that's what I'm encouraging everybody to do. Yeah, be scary. Kick them if you have to, if they get close enough. You know, I mean, not so much that you're going to kill them or wound them, but you know, let them know that when you encounter with them, it's not a good deal, and they want to think twice about that. Yeah, I'll have to look that up. I'll talk to PD about it, too. <coughs> Pardon me. All right, so um, another uh, method of dealing with it is through population monitoring and management. Um, so we do that by uh, management planning. We'll take a look at an area, especially a new development, for example. And we'll look at, you know, where, how's that habitat going to interact with people? I mean, if you have a really nice natural area, and then there's a bunch of people with fences that are open to that, and then there's a green belt which runs straight out into the edge of town, you're just going to be inviting coyotes to come in there, hang out in that center, and pick off cats, you know. So we'll help to kind of design uh, through planning how that's going to look and how wildlife might respond to that to try to prevent some of the conflict in the future. Um, but what we have already, we monitor. So we monitor the turkeys, we monitor Canada geese, we monitor the coyotes, and, you know, when they hit 
prescribed thresholds or activity levels, um, we can implement a treatment to them. And so, for example, like Canada geese, if they hit an action threshold, we'll start implementing nest removal and egg oiling, which essentially cuts out reproductive recruitment into that population. Um, but those are a long-lived bird, so it really does little to curb the impact, but it will lessen the growth of that impact. Egg oiling is, um, we, we use a food grade corn oil, and it's a, it's a, you know, if you've heard of egg addling, when you don't want an egg to be productive, if it's fertilized, you shake it and it breaks up the embryo, and then it's non-viable. Egg oiling is, is uh, where you coat the surface of the egg with oil and it blocks all the pores in the egg so it can't breathe and it won't develop. The, the, it, you, the timing has to be right to be humane. If you do it too early, there's a protective cuticle when the female lays the egg. She has a protective cuticle which is plugging all those pores. And uh, the reason that happens is once she has, when she begins to incubate and turn the eggs, they wear off and they wear off fairly consistently among the entire clutch. So she, that first egg she lays, she wants to, to not start, start maturing until that last one's laid. So she lays all these sheathed eggs and, and then once she starts incubating, she turns them around, those sheaths pull off, they all, the clock starts for all of them. And within a couple of hours, they all hatch out eventually, not hours from then when she starts incubating, but several weeks later, within a few hours of, of uh, each other. And that's a, a predator avoidance strategy. She doesn't want to be sitting there while her babies are scampering around, uh, and that one last egg, as she's waiting on it, and a coyote comes along, eats her and all her babies, that's not going to be the successful reproductive strategy. So, um, so the, cuti uh, the cuticle will protect it. Now, we have to get it after she started incubating, otherwise, um, it, you know, it's not going to do its job to plug those pores up. Um, even as she incubates and turns it around, that oil stays in there, so it won't start to develop. If we wait too long and the embryo is already starting to develop, we run the risk of seriously deforming but not killing that individual, that egg, which is bad. You know, we don't want to go there. It would be horrible to have a population of, you know, Canada geese with wings that are jetting backwards or one eye, you know, I mean, that's just, that's something we don't want to do. So, so we have a small window. We have to monitor, watch until she has her full, I mean, mark every, every single egg in there, come back. Very labor intensive, as you can imagine. I spend a lot of time doing that. Very costly. So we try not to do that when we don't have to. Um, luckily, though, with this drought, the habitat conditions in our local ponds hasn't been very ideal for them. So it's been kind of a natural deterrent. Um, wild turkeys, we do essentially the same thing. Uh, we can't oil the eggs, we're not permitted to do that, but when we find them, before there's eggs in there, we can remove them. Finding a wild turkey nest is next to impossible unless you see her and spend a lot of time watching it. So it's, it's a very difficult thing, again, very intensive. Hazing, much easier to do when you see them, you engage with them, you scare them, make them not wanna be here. Um, but those are the management actions the city can take. What's important with the turkeys in particular is feeding, the supplemental feeding. The whole reason the turkeys are doing so well in Davis is because they're finding a lot of food. You know, the, the resource is abundant to them. They're finding it in the landscaping, of course. I mean, that's, but the stuff they find in the landscaping is much harder to access and they have to go longer distances to find what they need in a day to, to, to get those calories they need for a day. When they find a bird feeder or someone throwing food on the ground, it's like, hey, this is gravy, we're gonna stay here. And, they just spend the, their life essentially right there in the neighborhood. So I know kind of where our populations, the concentrations are. I know there's people in there that are feeding them. And so I try to work with them to not feed them anymore. And it's been a real challenge without any kind of legal uh, uh, action and the stick, so to speak, to be able to get them to stop. Um, I find peer pressure works pretty good. So if I can get community involvement to start pressuring on that, you know, it's one thing for me to come to a person and say, you gotta stop doing it, nah. But your neighbors who you share the space with, you really gotta stop, it's, it's affecting us. And then they start listening a little more. Well, okay, I guess we'll stop. And so it improves the, the situation. Yeah. Right. Well, squirrels, people definitely are feeding them, but some people put peanuts out for the jays as well and, you know, the, in the bird feeders. So, um, 
Yeah, I mean, generally people shouldn't feed wildlife unless it's a bird feeder and seeds not getting to the ground, you know, which is a difficult thing to do. You have to put things there. And then they have to be squirrel proof so the squirrels can't get on there and good luck doing that. As you know, squirrels are pretty crafty. Um, so uh, while some of the wildlife planning we do, as you know, I've already mentioned, we look at projects and we kind of help guide those. Not impact avoidance and minimization, but we also look at what's that gonna do to wildlife populations later on. Um, and then we have policies which uh, help to protect wildlife that isn't necessarily protected already under state or federal um, uh, regulation. So we have, for example, the city of Davis has a disking ordinance which helps to protect burrowing owls in our, these small vacant parcels that we have around town. We have a leash law, of course that's everywhere, but we have one that's specific to the natural areas. Um, we have specific sites where people are allowed to have dogs off leash and it's guarantee you it's not going to be in a habitat area. Um, Management plans, again, you know, taking a look at a, a habitat area, um, figuring out what animals we want there, what's already there, how we want to maintain that without impacting those. Um, habitat creation and restoration, I already mentioned kind of some of the projects that we have, but also research so we can make sure we stay on top of what the current trend is in various management techniques and or habitat restoration techniques um, so we can try to produce the best wildlife habitat that we can. Um, so here's an example of planning, and I didn't mention we also plan for uh, problem wildlife, uh, for example, the coyote. And this is an example of one of the more recent uh, management plans that we put together for coyote, um, which the city council was interested in having it be a coexistence plan. Um, and this was essentially you know, the result of our community, our city council, getting very upset over you know, an incident that occurred where a bunch of coyotes were killed up off the golf course in Wild Horse. And um, uh, basically what it aims to do is figure out ways to, to help people live with the coyotes without implementing lethal removal. And you know, they're, they're the goal. So you know, we wanna promote coexistence with them. Uh, we're gonna use scientific research, current management practices, uh, provide outreach education, uh, tiered response to coyote behavior, um, and then if necessary, um, implement coyote behavioral modification, the hazing, send out our hazing teams. Um, these are some of the uh, guiding principles. Basically, the city likes wildlife. It's time and time again, it's because, you know, people have supported open space and habitat. They support local wildlife. There's a lot of people interested in behind that. Um, uh, you know, one thing to consider is that human safety is a priority when we're managing wildlife. Um, you know, coexistence is great unless those animals are causing damage to the population. It, it kind of has to be that line that's drawn there. Uh, preventative practices, uh, this comes with the outreach and education. Someone who's lost a cat to uh, um, a coyote, you know, generally it's like, well, what's, what's being done about these coyotes? They keep eating my cats. It's like, well, let's take about, you know, let's, let's take a quick look at what you're doing with your cats. You know, you, really, you know there's coyotes nearby, yet you continue to put them outside when those coyotes are by. So, Yes, of course, those coyotes are going to eat them. They look at them as food. You know, what are you going to do to protect your cat? And that kind of turns it and helps them understand that there's this relationship between their cat and that coyote, and it's not always a friendly one. Um, but looking at the habitat around the house, do we have a lot of bushes that the coyotes can get up undetected very closely? You might consider removing those or changing them. We look at our own uh, open space and wildlife areas. We Our grounds crews that manage those areas are constantly looking for uh, denning sites for coyotes. So if they're coming into the green belts and denning, we're gonna know about it and we can remove those den sites so that they're forced to go out. Um, and also how to appropriately interact with wildlife. You know, I think that's important. A lot of people's natural instinct when they see a coyote or even a large turkey is to kind of be scared of it and panic, turn and run. That kind of reinforces this dominance behavior that that animal, oh, I'm causing this human to run away. I'm the dominant one. I'm going to get closer to the next one and see if I can get some food out of them. Um, so all of those things are pretty key concepts to, to communicate. 
Um, also, you know, the city's unique in the sense that it has a staff wildlife biologist. And so I'm, I'm trained and I'm also current. And so I'm, you know, nearly guaranteeing the city is going to have the best available science to drive these management decisions. Uh, education outreach, very important. There's no way to, to coexist with wildlife without getting everybody uh, up to speed on, on what they're doing out there. Um, and then this, you know, this thing about lethal control, uh, pre preventative measures first, lethal control after, if necessary. And that kind of sums that one up. So management strategy. Um, oh, and incidentally on the back, if you guys don't see, didn't see it on the way in, you're welcome to try to uh, grab one. Well, you're welcome to grab one at the end. It'll be easy. They're not going to run away from you. Um, so there's three out, uh, handouts back there. There's uh, one on turkeys. This is actually a Department of Fish and Wildlife publication. It's a little outdated. You know, they're still under the impression that, uh, you know, nothing can be done. Uh, it's very kind of bleak, but they say don't feed them and everything will be fine. I mean, obviously, that's they're using one method, right? And I said use multiple, but anyway, it can be useful. It, it may give you useful contacts to complain to the state about this. Um, I didn't say that. Um, so then there's this one uh, fact sheet on coyotes, um, especially if you live around the edges of town or you live near a green belt that's directly connected to the edge of town. Um, you're in coyote country. There's going to be coyotes there. This is some really useful stuff to help you uh, understand them, but also protect your critters and keep the coyotes at bay. And then if you really want to get involved and you're having issues with coyotes and or turkeys or any other thing that's going to be responsive to hazing, here's a coyote hazing field guide. And there's lots of good things, you know, to tell you about what to do and how to, oops, it's upside down, how to keep them on the run. Um, you know, what's the, when to do it, how to do it, and uh, why you're doing it. So you can explain to your neighbors <laughs> the craziness that you're engaged in. Um, but anyway, useful stuff there for you. So management strategy, how do we, how do we uh, plan on, on implementing this coyote plan? So basically, again, we're looking at three main elements to it. Community outreach education, complaint investigation and response, and then attack response. And we kind of keep those two uh, isolated because far majority of things that come in are complaint, complaints just because people saw them. Extremely, extremely rare, in fact, it's happened maybe once in the last 30 years in the state of California that anybody's been directly attacked by a coyote that was uninstigated. And I'll put the caveat in there that wildlife handlers or you know, someone who's in there and it's a distressed animal, yeah, they're gonna get bit, right? Hopefully not, but it can happen and it happens frequently for those people. Um, but in general, the general public, it's extremely rare a coyote runs up, bites you, just to bite you. It's generally provoked. Um, and I think that one case, the last time it happened was a child that was left unattended up against a open space, no fence, you know, mom left the, you know, I mean, this was like an infant, couldn't even walk and left it out there and the coyote came up, grabbed it and started to run off with it and mom came out, scared it off. But that evil coyote came and tried to eat my baby and it's like, okay, mom, <laughs> what were you thinking? You know, when's the last time you saw a coyote running around here? You're in open space, you're in their habitat, so think ahead. Um, so, uh, again, stressing removing food and other attractants, keeping pets on leash when you're out in coyote country, um, and be that scary human. Be scary, you know, let them know that we're not to be um, messed with, and then they'll start keeping their distance. Uh, complaint investigation and response. Uh, so, this basically me going out, someone saw a coyote, I go out, and if I know there's a coyote in that area and they're calling, hey, I saw it, okay, great, thanks, you know, I can document that time. If it's a new site, Oh, coyotes haven't been there yet. I want to go out and see. I want to see the habitat. I want to see how they're moving around. I want to see, more importantly, how they might be coming in and impacting that community. Um, so then I can begin outreach to that community. And we have a group of volunteers uh, that are dedicated to this program. They are, we have outreach education folks who will go target those communities with those flyers, knock on doors if they have to. Um, to get the word out, say, look, you have coyotes here. This is what might happen. This is what you should do. Um, and then if those coyotes get to a point where they require hazing, they're very brazen, they're coming in, snagging cats during the day while everybody's around, a uh, campfire or whatever, or campfire during the day, it'd be odd. But anyway, you know, in the, when there's a lot of humans around and it comes in and it does this behavior, that's when you go, okay, 
this animal is a little too comfortable, it needs to be pushed. And so these teams will go out, three or four people, you know, they'll start honking at them, they throw rat, uh, cans full of gravel. Um, they can't hit them, they can't do any physical contact with the animal um, by law, but they can harass them, haze them to a point where it's, this is where you should be. So they'll chase them out into the field and then they'll retreat, they'll go back. And then they'll kind of observe and watch when the coyotes, what's that? Yeah, right, yeah. Well, actually, it probably wouldn't work for another carnivore. Hey, whatever, is there food here? This is great. Um, but so, so the idea is to push them out to a comfortable level. That's where we want them. And then you retreat. And then you kind of watch, see what they do. If they start coming back, you push them back out further this time. And then you retreat back to where your lion is. So eventually they get it. Okay, when I come to this point, they are angry with me, you know, freaky. I don't even want to be there. And they're just like our pet dogs. You know, you can train them to do things that you want them to do. Uh, and then attack response is that last one. So it hasn't happened. Hopefully it won't happen with these uh, preventative measures, the hazing, the education outreach. But if it does happen, we will respond to those and that animal will be destroyed. Uh, so some of the limitations of this particular plan, and actually we can think about other management plans like a turkey management plan. Some of these may apply there as well. Um, but education outreach might not be, uh, it might not work for changing human behavior. And we might not get that, those people to bring in their pets at night or to leave food out for the turkeys or, you know, close up their cat door when the raccoon's getting into their house, you know, these kinds of things. Um, Management practices might not be effective at changing the behavior of the animals that you're trying to push back. You know, coyote might just be like, I am so tame. I like eating in your house and I want to be there and so I'm not going to listen to you. All right, you know, you have to start considering lethal removal of that, that animal. Um, trap and relocation is illegal and ecologically irresponsible. So a lot of people who call me and say, you know, can somebody just come out and trap this thing and take it off to Happy Acres and, you know, we'll all go our separate ways. And it's like, well, no. If someone comes out and traps it, they legally have to euthanize it or release it right where they trapped it. That's the way the law is written. Um, which doesn't make sense to release it right there if that's a problem animal, right? So. Um, the reasoning behind it is, and, when it, and this is where the ecologically irresponsible, there's a political reason behind it, but I won't go there. The, ecologically, uh, uh, the ecological issue is that, you know, if you take an animal from here and say it's got a disease and you take it over here and put it into a population of otherwise healthy animals, now you've set this one ablaze. Um, similarly, you take this animal and this one's already at some harmony, carrying capacity, and you put an additional one in there now resource competition gets very stressed, the whole system is out of balance, there can be a problem either way. Um, that animal has a high likelihood of being placed in here not knowing where it's at, not knowing where its resources are, um, you know, meet hostile competitors of a similar species there, it's not gonna last very long. It may be days and, you know, yeah, it's gonna suffer to a point where it's either gonna survive or it's gonna live a pretty marginal life. So. The humanity of it is kind of, you know, marginal. Is it going to die? It might. There's a higher risk of that. So you might as well just kill it here. It's the sad truth of it. Um, the one thing the plan in most wildlife plans cannot do is supersede federal and state and county regulations uh, or policies, especially the ones that give rights to property owners to do what they need to do to protect their resources. So. You know, and like as I mentioned before, anybody can do what they need to do to get it done, you know, to protect it. If someone wants to run out, run out in their backyard and club that sweet opossum sitting on the fence because they don't like it there, then technically that's legal, even though it's not really disturbing any of their, their property, but in their mind, it, they might be protecting it. So I think we get into the whole gun issue on that, but we're not going to go there. Okay, so that's essentially what I have for you guys tonight, but I'm hoping we can fill up the last couple of minutes here, depending on how long you guys want to be, um, to answer some questions. Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask, you know, when you were talking about the coyote, the mitigation, the plan, mm -hmm. everything, and it was brought about by um, the incident on um, the golf course, right. the golf course, golf course. I think that was U.S. Wildlife Services? USDA Wildlife Services. Now, 
We do not. Or are both of those contracts free from wildlife services? The one contract we had with wildlife services was actually a joint contract with other uh, communities in Yolo County. It used to be handled by Yolo County. Yolo County didn't want to handle it anymore, so um, no, the, cities had to the cities came together, went under contract. Uh, that was in 2010. Uh, the city, just by default, decided to stay on it. I mean, there, I had asked council to reconsider it at that point, but nothing was considered, and so we just stayed under contract with it. Um, however, after that coyote incident, that was enough to rattle the cage more than my voice was able to, because all of you guys came in and we were like, no, this can't happen they were able to change their minds on that and, and back away from the contract. So we, we do not have a contract with animal services. And the volunteers, you mentioned that you have volunteers mm -hmm. for, you know, either coyotes or turkeys or yeah, yeah. amazing stuff. Are you, do you guys still looking for volunteers? Absolutely. So this address right here is the best way to get hold of me. Um, and just send me an email saying I'm interested in joining your wildlife volunteer and I I'll email you back and say, okay, this is what we can use. This is what uh, we don't have anybody doing yet, but you might be interested in doing it. Okay. Could be, if, if you have some spare time on the weekends, it might be going and looking at, uh, for Swainson's Hawk Nest or something around town. I, you know, I mean, it can be as fun as that, or it could be as boring, depending on how you, I like doing that, but I can't do it on the weekends. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that's missing from our habitat, I feel like Davis, is toads. And I was mm. told Right. And if something happened that a third to a half of the population just died Disappeared. Out. And I didn't know, I, nobody that I know knows why. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, um, you know, if there's anything you've done or how to reinvigorate the population of California. That's a great question. Um, I have a theory, but again, no one, like you're suggesting, has researched the exact reason as to why they crashed out. Um, but the, the bulk of the population, I think, what you're referring to is at the, um, the core area pond. So it was this pond down off of Second Street. There was a large breeding population there. And when they decided to, when the city wanted to put in the overcrossing, the pole line overcrossing there, they had to use some of that pond for borrow to build up the embankment. And then also the physical placement of that embankment cut them off from a lot of estivation habitat, um, which occurred out into the then vacant fields south of that property. Um, so that effectively isolated them from a critical element of their habitat. They still had their breeding habitat. That was left unchanged, if not improved. But their important... That would be in south, I guess, right? Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, east of that spot. So not oh. south, Davis. The, 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 the pond itself is... South North Davis, it was, it was right on Second Street, right on the uh, the I-80 corridor, um, and, and so I was I was wrong, not to the south. Their estivation habitat was to the east, out by where the post office is, and and further down that way, past Sid Works, and down along that way. Um, so the uh, so so like I said, the breeding habitat remains. It's actually improved. It's pretty decent amphibian breeding habitat there for native frogs and toads, um, but the estivation habitat, which was equally important was they were isolated from it. And actually they had the foresight to think, hmm, you know, actually it was by accident because they were finding a lot of dead toads on the pole line once they, overcrossing once they found it, because the toads were trying to get over to their, their places to hide during the summer. And, um, you know, so they were getting caught in the street and killed, but as they, uh, you know, were building this thing, they decided to do a redesign and include a, a toad tunnel the infamous stone tunnel of Davis, um, which they installed in there, you know, best intention, but poorly executed and non-effective. So the population crashed. So where is the population now? There are some pockets around Davis, um, a lot of stock ponds and stuff in the ag fields, along Poudre Creek in the backwaters, there's still toad habitat. But they're very much more of an upland animal. They need the water to breed, but they've spent a lot of their time up. But north of the state, it's wiped out. And yeah. Right. right. And actually, I've been monitoring that pond for the last 14 years for larvae, and Pacific chorus frog do quite well down there. Um, 
bullfrog don't do well, which is nice because it gives the, the tree frog, the, or the chorus frog, the, the leg up, no pun intended. Um, and as far as the toads go, I haven't found those guys. Uh, nope, I haven't found any larva in the surveys around and the, the various wetlands that we have. But I know uh, from other herpetologists that there are isolated pockets of them still around. I have a question about turkeys. Hmm? Yeah. Um, no, uh, because they are regulated by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the only thing you can do to them would be to trap and cull it. Because if you're t talking about keeping it, you're talking about trapping it. Not necessarily putting a trap with a, you know, to, to capture it in a confined space, but you would be harboring it in your backyard. Uh, probably in a cage or a facility, otherwise they're going to hightail it out of there. Um, so there, in a sense, you're trapping it, and, th and that would be illegal unless you euthanized it or re-released it on that site. Yeah. Um, could you harvest it in your backyard? Legally, no. Um, and that's something I'd mentioned, kind of alluded to earlier, was I could spend a whole other hour talking about it, but I'll give you the concise summary. Um, Department of Fish and Game uh, allows the take for harvest uh, of turkeys, but the only way they allow it is uh, to, to take them is with a shotgun or a rifle or a bow and arrow. All three of those methods of take are illegal, illegal in the city of Davis. So, uh, so we're kind of at this, th th there's a solution there to both the offending population increase and the problems we're having with the turkeys um, and the difficulty with having any kind of uh, uh, coordinated assault on them, if you will, to trap. You know, we've tried that in the past and it's failed miserably. We've spent a lot of time and money trying to do it. Um, so to allow harvest, to open harvest up, we, we have some sustainability goals that are met there, right? Local, it doesn't get more local than that. If you can find a great source of protein in your backyard, wonderful. You know, there's people out there that want to do that. They like to eat turkey. They're quite delicious, by the way, if you haven't eaten them. Way different than the store-bought stuff. Um, the, uh, the options would be in town, obviously we wouldn't be able to legalize someone firing a shotgun or a rifle in town or even a bow and arrow, the safety issues obviously. But, you know, could you hand capture them? Some of these turkeys, arguably, yes you could. They are tame enough where you could walk up to one and corner it, grab it. Um, throw a net on it, possibly. That would be, you know, it's not illegal, but it could be a legal form to take them if it, the law was changed. Um, uh, some people suggested bolos, going back to some primitive you know, tools, so the rocks with the string, and whoosh, it's an entanglement device, so then you can run up and grab it. Um, so, you know, I mean, that is something that the, currently the California uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife Code, well, actually the Department of Fish and Game Code uh, doesn't allow, but there's certainly um, high hopes that there could be some modifications made to allow people to access it. Now they would probably say, well, it's on you to manage that population sustainably, right? Because we don't want to wipe out the turkeys. Maybe we do. I, actually, I think some people would argue, yes, we do. But that's not going to happen. Even if we were able to get all of them, if we were somehow by a stroke of genius, someone came up with a device that could instantly capture everybody at the same time at the push of a button, boom, boom, done, take them away. There's hundreds of turkeys around us that are just waiting to discover the glorious abundance of food here in Davis. So um, really it has to be, the main focus has to be on controlling the amount of feeding that's occurring and then helping people batten down the hatches to deal with the impacts that they're, they're receiving from them. Because it's going to be an issue. The turkeys are here, they're not gonna be going away. But we could control the amount of turkeys that are here and that could be done through like, for example, people have some sort of uh, access for har harvesting them. Yeah, that's all fair game. As long as you can shoot there, you'd have to look at the county shooting restrictions. I just, any other questions from this side? Okay, all right. <laughs> Does monarch butterfly migrate through Davis? 
Do they migrate through? Uh, they breed here as well. Yeah, okay. we'll, we'll see them come in. We'll see them breed here. So planting milkweed here is Yeah, yep, absolutely. Yeah. In fact, a lot of our, uh, uh, we've been working with researchers on campus who are interested in establishing milkweed colonies around. Um, so a lot of our open space areas, we've opened up to them. Go ahead, plan away. And they've been out there putting milkweed here and there. And we see it out in the ag fields. It just pops up in the random disturbed places. And you're, oh, beautiful milkweed. And you go and look, and there's that beautiful monarch larva on there munching away. So they do quite well. We also see painted ladies. Um, they migrate through in mass on occasion. Anyway, Any other questions? No? All right, well, thanks for coming out tonight. Thank you.